to worship is 1 Peter 2, 13 through 25. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God, that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men, and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor. If for the sake of conscience towards God a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if, when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you, patient, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. For you have been called to this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, and while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept trust entrusting himself to him who judges rightly, righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep. But now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Amen. Please join us this morning as we sing our opening praise song, Christ for the World We Sing, page 686. service and it's a week before Memorial Day and so this morning I just want to say welcome and praise the Lord this is the day that the Lord hath made and I'm glad that you're able to join it with us um, this day this week uh, we're 
finishing up May, and I pray that you all are are handling the lock-in well. It's difficult. Illinois is on lockdown still. Our governor has got us got us still under phase two of a five phase plan, and it looks like it will go on forever. But we know it will not, and we know that the Lord is in control. So let's praise him this morning for being who he is as we continue to sing and praise. Please pray with me as we open our service. Lord, I thank you so much for this day, for this opportunity we have to gather in this place, to gather as your people, and for those who are not with us this morning in this building, but are gathered across the internet, I just praise you for the ability, the technology that we have to come together as one, even though we are remotely located. Lord, I thank you for being the great God that you are, as we struggle through different changes in our life, changes that see a virus that seems to be running through society, changes that sees businesses and, and work shut down, where people who want to work are not able to work. Lord, people are struggling to pay bills and buy food. I just praise you that you are continually working. You're working in us and through us. You're working through your people to help one another. You're working through your people to just encourage others. And so, Lord, as you continue to work, may you be glorified. And as we sing out loud this morning, I just pray that you will accept this, these songs as an offering and testament of our worship, that it will be a sweet fragrance to your ears, and that we can continue to be filled with your spirit as we leave this place and leave this time of worship. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Our next song is page 544. The Bond of Love. Please join us as we sing our praise songs. sing the apart word but that's just to remind us that we are remotely located page 564 <laughs>
there shall be showers of blessings. Page 580. There shall be showers of blessings. from God. He continues to bless us daily beyond what we even recognize. Let's continue to sing for our communion hymn, um, I'd Rather Have Jesus. And as we do this, uh, Mr. Hart's meditation will follow, and then we'll have prayer and a time for you to join us in communion.
Sometimes it's hard to understand what God is doing in our life. But over time, we've learned we can identify His fingerprints in several ways. First, the work of God is was creative and powerful. He made heaven and earth and all living creation, creations, and He knitted, knitted each one of us in our mother's womb. Then through his son Jesus, his powerful accomplishment of salvation for all who trust in the Savior. What's more, he adopted all believers into his family. Second, we can see God's work through Christ-centered prayers which narrow our focus on the Lord. When we pray actively and persistently, we can more readily and identify his actions and see to join him. Third, the work of God becomes clear to a focused heart which prepares us to listen and obey. Reg regularly concentrating on God's word will clear our mind and help us understand what the Lord is up to. Have you been too busy or discouraged? are distracted to notice what God is doing. If you want to perceive his work, these things can give you a fresh perspective. Admit your lack of attention and refocus your heart and your mind to the Lord. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Join us for communion and please participate as we at your own homes as we participate here. But let's first pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this day and this opportunity we have to bow before you and come and partake of this communion that you bring to us. You command us to do this in remembrance of you, in remembrance that you freely laid down your life. You gave it as a ransom for our sin as we partake of the cup we're reminded of the blood that you that was spilt for our sins to wash him away to cl cleanse us as white as snow lord your body that was hung on the cross and broken there lord we thank you so much for that great love and that you came again you conquered death you rose on the, from the grave on the third day and so as we partake of this may you put our sins as far as the east is from the west that we can walk in righteousness because you have forgiven us once and for all you said it was finished on the cross and so whether the sins are future past or present we know that we have forgiveness but help us lord to walk in righteousness as your people it's in your name we pray amen Okay, please join us as we recite the Lord's Prayer, and it's on, on your screen today. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Today, our sermons is, is a series of two, two days. It's called Joseph, Famine Fighter, and How to Enslave a Nation. It's from Genesis 41 through 47. And next week, we're going to go a little bit further and to seeing how freedom is not a privilege, or is a privilege but not a right, how prosperity is not a right but a privilege, um, and the responsibility that poverty and wealth is not, are not evils and that God's provision for his people does not require national prosperity. Um, and so good morning and welcome. The reason I've chosen this for our sermon series, um, we'll probably come back to the graphic that was just on the screen, but the reason I chose this as our sermon series is because there's just a lot of people that I speak to in the state of Illinois, um, at least where I live, that are really tired of being ordered by our governor to be locked in, to be, sh to be shut, to be stay at home, to not be able to have the freedom to move as they desire. And many of them don't believe the governor has the power to do what he's doing, to issue the orders that he's issuing over and over to keep us as virtual prisoners. And I know many people would disagree that we're virtual prisoners or, or like prisoner, prisoners, but certainly it seems like our freedoms have have, have, have been restricted, our freedom of movement, our freedom to go where we want, when we want. And well, I guess one of the things that happened this past week as well is on Friday, the Wisconsin Supreme Court, I believe, overturned their governor's uh, reissuance of an executive order. And as soon as they did that, it made, all, it made the stay-at-home order null and void. And there was no other orders in place. And so within hours, I'm told, within hours of that Supreme Court ruling, the bars and taverns were full again. People were in without masks. They were celebrating. They were enjoying life. They were living and not dying. They were living and having fun. But within hours of that, I've read that different city municipalities decided to pick up the mantle and issue their own orders. And so it just got me thinking that I grew up believing that we were in the land of the free, the home of the brave, or vice versa, and that we were free people. And, and, and this pandemic has shown me that there is no end to people claiming authority in my life. There is no end. If the state doesn't have the authority, the city tries to, to claim it, or the county. And they may not be like thugs breaking into my house, telling me what I can and cannot do, but the question remains, do they have authority? As Christians, we need to trust in the Lord. We need to do what the call to worship says. We need to honor God by honoring those who are in, in authority over us. And so this week I want to uh, cover a little bit about what we can learn from Joseph and then next week talk more about our responsibilities in this society. Because even if we disagree with the governor or the cities, we need to show honor to those that God has established as authorities over us. Today, if you go down to the previous slide, today we're going to learn lessons from Joseph, famine fighter, and we're going to learn that we can trust God. We're going to learn that we need to work as if we're working for the Lord. We need, we're going to learn how, through Joseph fighting the famine, that forgive we need to forgive because we have been forgiven and we're going to learn that we need to be kind and compassionate. These are lessons learned through Joseph. So please follow along with me as we read the text. I will be reading from select sections from chapter 41 and 47 of Genesis, but the entire section of Genesis, the, from starting 41, uh, will be discussed 
It's just that's a very long section, so I will condense the the the, the yeah. I, I will just paraphrase it for our benefit. Genesis chapter forty-one. Please follow along on the screen. Now Joseph was thirty years old when he stood before Pharaoh, the king king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt. During the seven years of plenty, the land brought forth abundantly. So he gathered all the food of these seven years, which occurred in the land of Egypt, and placed the food in the cities. He placed in every city the food from its own surrounding fields. Thus Joseph stored up grain in great abundance, like the sand of the sea, until he stopped measuring it, for it was beyond measure." When the seven years of plenty, which had been in the land of Egypt, came to an end, and the seven years of famine began to come, just as Joseph had said, then there was famine in all the lands. But in the, all the land of Egypt, there was bread. So when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried out to the Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said to the Egyptians, go to Joseph, whatever he says to you, you shall do. When the famine was spread over all the face of the earth, then Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians. The, and the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. The people of all the earth came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe in all the earth. And then jumping ahead to chapters 47, and before I read 47, um, just to give us a little bit of context, as you know, Joseph is one of our favorite Bible study characters from days gone back from childhood on. We learn about Joseph and his amazing multicolored coat. We learn, learn about him uh, being betrayed and sold into slavery by his brothers and how he eventually ends up before Pharaoh to interpret some dreams. And as he interprets the Pharaoh's dreams, the dreams tell us that he is that there's going to be seven years of plenty and abundance and seven years of famine. And, and Joseph says, God has shown you this, Pharaoh, so that you can prepare so Egypt will not pass away, but will be saved. And so chapter 41 there, Pharaoh appoints Joseph as the administrator of this project and makes him basically second in command only to Pharaoh and all of Egypt. And so Joseph administers and collects just as we read. So now Genesis 47, follow along as we, well, just jump back to me. Before 47, you all remember the story then, his brothers are in Palestine and they are running out of food. The famine is, is worldwide. It's affecting them as well. And so Jacob, Israel, sends the brothers down to Egypt to buy food. And you remember the story. There's, there's um, a setup of Joseph setting his brothers up so that they can get Benjamin back there. But eventually, Joseph is able to get both his, his brothers and his father um, back and their whole household to move to Egypt. Um, where they're taken care of. So in, in chapter 47 here. So Joseph settled his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in, in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had ordered. Joseph provided his father and his brothers and all his father's household with food according to their little ones. Now, there was no food in all the land because the famine was very severe, so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished because of the famine. Joseph gathered all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the grain which they bought, and Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. When the money was all spent in the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us food! For why should we die in your presence? For our money is gone. Then Joseph said, Give up your livestock, and I will give you food for your livestock, since your money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them food in exchange for the horses and the flocks and the herds and the donkeys, and he fed them with food in exchange for all their livestock that year. When that year was ended, they came to him the next year and said to him, we will not hide from my Lord that our money is all spent 
and the cattle are my Lord's. There is nothing left for my Lord except our bodies and our lands. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for food, and we and our land will be slaves to Pharaoh. So give us seed that we may live and not die, and that the land may not be desolate. So Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh. For every Egyptian sold his field because the famine was severe upon them. Thus the land became Pharaoh's. As for the people, he removed them to the cities from one end of Egypt's border to the other. Only the land of the priests did he not buy. For the priests had an allotment from Pharaoh, and they lived off of the allotment which Pharaoh gave them. Therefore they did not sell their land. Then Joseph said to the people, Behold, today I have bought, bought you and your land for Pharaoh. Now here is seed for you and, you, and you may sow the land. At the harvest you shall give a fifth to Pharaoh, and four fifths shall be for your own seed, or for your, for your own, for seed of the field, and for your food, and for those of your households, as, and as for food for your little ones. So they said, you have saved our lives. Let us find favor in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's slaves. Joseph made it a statute concerning the land of Egypt, valid to this day, that Pharaoh should have the fifth. Only the land of the priests did not become Pharaoh's. Now Israel lived in the land of Egypt and Goshen, and they acquired property in it and were fruitful and became very numerous. Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years, so the length of Jacob's life was 147 years. Amen. So you guys remember the story, and we kind of went through this, this sec section, and it's, it's a kind of an interesting story, and especially chapter 47. And I always approach chapter 47 because it seems kind of good and bad. You look at it, and on the surface, Joseph is doing, is, is saving the world. He's, he's, he's doing what God's dream was meant to do. He's storing up an abundance of food during the seven years of plenty, and he's using that storage of wealth during the seven years of famine to fight the famine, to feed the people, to ensure that they do not die off. And these are all positive things. But then we look at some of the things that are going on, and there's people that accuse Joseph of not being very kind, of being very extreme, that he enslaves the population. Because before this time, the Egyptians are free. They own their land. They own their cattle. They planted fields. And apparently they, they, they gave to Pharaoh because when this project started, Joseph was able to extract abundance from the people. I don't know if he bought it, or just tax them for it, but he was able to take and store that abundance. But what I'm going to tell you is I do not believe that Joseph was actually ungodly. In fact, I think he exhibited many of the traits that we should aspire to. And even though those traits resulted in the enslavement of a nation, the Egyptians, that was not Joseph's fault and it was actually Joseph should be doing acts of kindness in order to make that happen. So I want to go through that in the graphics that we see today on the screen. Uh, the four points I want to make is that we can trust God. Um, we need to work as if we're working for the Lord. We need to forgive because we've been forgiven. And we need to be kind and compassionate. These are lessons that we learn from Joseph, the famine fighter. So um, first thing, we can trust God. We can trust God. If you remember, th throughout Joseph's life, at any point in Genesis, before he's Pharaoh's administrator, if you were to look at Joseph, he was in some bad situations. And even in those bad situations, we see that God was working in Joseph's life, that God, God had a plan and was working that plan. Look at the different things that happened to him that was bad, though. His brothers betrayed him. His brothers threw him in the dry well. 
They sold him into slavery to some of his cousins. His character was assassinated wrongly and falsely. He was accused and went to prison uh, for, the, for the false accusations. All throughout this time period, at any point in his life, he was a slave, he was imprisoned, and he could look at any point in that life and say, God, what are you doing to me? Why am I here in prison? You told me I was going to be a shining star, that people, my brothers were going to bow down to me, and yet I'm languishing in prison. But yet, we don't see Joseph doing that. Joseph is trusting the Lord throughout his entire ordeal. The only time that he might have had doubts or, or any doubts showing is when he asks the, the cupbearer to remember him when he returns to Pharaoh's court. But even that is just, you know, remember me, um, is, is nothing bad. Through all the bad things that happened in, jo in Joseph's life, we see that God was working. But not only was God working, we also see that God was preparing Joseph for the service that he was going to continue to do. And remember, even when he was sold in slavery in the Potiphar's household, even when he was in the dungeons of Pharaoh, he was still doing, using the gifts that God had given him. He was working with all his might in Potiphar's household to do a good job in the job that, that Potiphar had put him in. And God blessed him. And he did a good job. He worked as if he were working unto the Lord. He was diligent. He was honest. And it showed. He was Potiphar's manager. And he was in prison. He was a jailer's manager. He was an administrator. And he worked well with those things. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. As you look back through Joseph's life, you can see at, at the end how God worked it all for Joseph's good, that he prepared Joseph for this day where he would be put in charge of all of Egypt, only second to Pharaoh. A daunting task. God prepared him. We can trust God because... Joseph's story shows us we can trust him. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6 reads, Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you, so that we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? We can trust God. And so as, as you see the graphic on the screen, uh, what we can see here, is that um, Joseph trusts in God and trusts in God's preparation because when Pharaoh says, I am going to appoint you to this task, we don't see Joseph stuttering or hemming and hawing or making excuses of why he can't do this job. He simply does the job that he's been appointed to. He trusts in God's preparation. So we can trust God, and the story shows that over and over again. Next point, we can trust God. We need to work as if we're working for the Lord. Okay, Genesis 47, 14 says that Joseph gathered all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan for the, or I'm sorry, let's do, do Colossians first. Colossians 3, 22 through 24 says, slaves, in all things, obey those who are your masters on earth. Let's start that again. Slaves, in all things, obey those who are, are your masters on earth, not with external services or service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily 
as for the Lord rather than for man, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Work as you're working for the Lord. As we see Joseph in any of his situations, in prison, in Potiphar's service, he is serving as if he were serving the Lord. He is not bemoaning his situation. He is not looking to the future and saying, oh, someday I hope my situation changes. He is serving God and trusting God no matter what the role is, whether Potiphar's manager, prison manager, or in Pharaoh's court. Joseph works wholeheartedly for his king and his Pharaoh, and he does nothing for personal gain. If you look at Genesis 47, 14, Pharaoh says, Go, the Egyptians cry out to Pharaoh and say, give us food. And Pharaoh sends him to Joseph and says, do what he says. Why did Pharaoh say do what he says? Because Pharaoh had faith in Joseph. He knew Joseph was working for him, that Joseph's decisions would be positive for Pharaoh. And so we see in 47, 14, Joseph gathered all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, for the grain which they brought, brought or bought, and Joseph brought the money where? Into his pocket, into his personal bank accounts? Did he divert it to his family in Canaan? No. He brought the money into Pharaoh's household, the task in which he was assigned. He was assigned the task of working for Pharaoh to ensure the people were saved and that Pharaoh was enriched. His job was to serve Pharaoh, and he worked that job as if he were working for the Lord. Our third point is forgive, because you have been forgiven. And this is throughout Scripture, we see this. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. In Matthew, it says, huh, I don't believe that verse got changed on our screen. So the graphics on the screen is wrong because those graphics should be um, the Matthew that we, or just the, the, uh, the Lord's Prayer. We ask the Lord to forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. We are told to forgive, and as we forgive others, in the same way it will be extended to us. Forgiveness, our forgiveness of others is so important. If, if lack of forgiveness can drive wedges and separate us from, from the love of God, <clears throat> but as we extend mercy to others, that, that grace and mercy enables us to receive the mercy from God, and, and that's a great thing. <clears throat> um, nothing about this slide is right except that Joseph forgave. Joseph forgave his brothers. His brothers had betrayed him, had thrown him in the well, had sold him into slavery. At any point in his life, he could have blamed his circumstances on his brothers. But again, he trusted God. And in, at the very end, he says, that which you meant for, for evil, that which you meant for evil, throwing me in the well, leaving me to die, selling me off to the Midianites. God, they say Midianites, God caused for good. Joseph saw God as the author, ultimate author of all of it. Even though their acts were evil, God's was pure and for Joseph's good. And so we need to forgive <clears throat> so that we can receive God's forgiveness. It's, it's a basic principle, and we've seen it over and over. And Joseph is, again, shows us that principle in play. Joseph forgave. <clears throat> the last point here is we need to be kind and compassionate. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Ephesians 4.32. We need to forgive or we need to be kind and compassionate to one another. Colossians 3.12 says, Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. 
Joseph deals kindly, not harshly, with the Egyptians. It, we might think that he dealt harshly with them because when they were at their weakest and starving, he enslaves them. He takes their their land, or he takes their money from them, then he takes their animals from them, and then he takes their property and their very uh, freedom away from them. And that's a charge that people make at, at Joseph. But as we look through the text, we see Joseph doing the job that he was assigned to do, and that was to, to protect Pharaoh's interests. And we also don't get the impression through the text that Joseph's, that Pharaoh's dream was a secret or Joseph's interpretation was a secret. In fact, he, I, I, I'm speculating here, but in order to get the Egyptians to buy into the collection of grain during the seven years of plenty, it seems like they would have had to have known the prediction that there's seven years of plenty and abundance far more than we would ever use. And during those years, we're going to collect it and store it up, and we're going to store it up in cities and storehouses local to your communities. And this will be good. And the Egyptians complied. In fact, so much came in, so much came in that they stopped keeping counts of it because there was so much. There was an abundance. Never could they use it. <clears throat> Pardon me. And so, during the years of plenty, the Egyptians could have been storing up for them for the years of liens to, that were coming. God told them this was going to occur. Joseph said it will happen. They could have taken that to the bank. <clears throat> but what we find is as, after that first year of famine, the Egyptians are out of food. They acted and lived as if the bounty was never going to end, that the plenteous rain of blessing was going to fall forever. And when they ran out of food, they came to Joseph and they said, remember us, remember us. And so Joseph sells them the food. But again, they run out. There's nothing for them to do. And Joseph knows that they have their farms and they have their animals, but they have no way of feeding their animals and there's no one to buy their animals because they're out of money. And so it is a good thing for him to take control of all the animals because they have no way of keeping the animals. And finally, finally, he does enslave them in the, in, in the next year. But as we see here, the word, the enslavement, enslavement takes many forms. When I showed the graphic of enslaving the nation, some people would, would be very bothered by that word because the wor word enslave or slavery brings up, conjures up recent history in our country where slavery was a very evil and harsh thing. Un unthinkable evils and atrocities happen in, in the name of slavery in, in our country. But not all slavery is like that. And in this case, as I read through this, their slavery was actually not that bad. They come to Joseph and they actually see Joseph as a savior. They don't see him as an oppressor. They don't see him as an user or an abuser. And Joseph did none of it for personal gain. He did it because he saw himself as a savior of the people. In fact, he tells his brothers that um, he, that God did this to save lives. He might have been thinking of the life of his family, but in, in a broader extent, the Egyptians saw him as a savior of their country. Now, and Joseph did indeed save lives. As we read through 41, 56, and 57, um, there was widespread famine, and, um, and he fed the people in the midst of this widespread famine. But here's the interesting thing. He instituted the, he instituted the tax of one-fifth 
And from that point on, the, the Egyptians were no longer, the, the Egyptians were no longer free. They were slaves to Pharaoh. He moved them off their property, probably in an attempt to break the, the bondage of, or the, the bonds that they would have with the property. He moved them around to show that they, their property no longer belonged to them. But then he gives them seed every year. So they can plant their fields. Or he gives them seed when, it's, when the famine's over so that they can plant their fields. They're kind of like um, bond servants or sharecroppers. They're living on the land and they have to give one-fifth, 20%, back to Pharaoh. If you think about it, tax time having just recently passed, although we've got an extension, if you think of all the taxes that you pay in your life in a given year, 20% seems pretty low. From all the estimates that I read, we pay far more in taxes. And so as we look at it, we here in the home of the brave, the land of the free, are far more enslaved to the city, the county, the state, the federal government than we ever even thought. But the lesson that we learned from Joseph is, on the screen now, we can trust God. We can work as if working for the Lord. Don't let the temporary circumstances of our life get us down. And we need to forgive others as we, because we have been forgiven. And that includes our leaders. And we need to be kind and compassionate. We need to be respectful to our leaders. We need to show love to one another. And Joseph seems to embody all of these. Next week, we're going to, as I said, jump into learning um, a little bit more about the, we're going to learn a little bit more about what Joseph did and more how it applies to our own situation. But for now, we can praise God this week as we move into Memorial Day and we remember those things, those people who have given their lives so that we can have freedom. We need to learn more about what that responsibility of freedom is. And we need to continue to glorify God because it's his blessings that continue to provide for us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is, They'll Know We Are Christians by Our Love, page 677. They will know we are Christians by our love. And that is a true statement. Let's be people of love.
Amen. Praise the Lord. He is a good God and he loves us. Uh, please join me as we close in prayer. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for this day and for this opportunity we've had to come and sing praises to you. And though we're not all in the same place, I trust that we are all glorifying you, worshiping you, whether out loud or to ourselves, Lord. May you be praised and glorified because you are worthy. Lord, as we read the story of Joseph, some of the things sound, sound confusing and strange, but ultimately we see the character traits that Joseph displays and how we need to do that in our life. You are a great God, and we want to walk in righteousness, even though we've been forgiven. Once and for all, for all sins, past, present, and future, you deserve our righteousness and we can only walk in righteousness as you strengthen us and that will only happen as we come to you and bow at your feet so help each of us walk in humility bow to you and listen to you that as we said last week we are christians under construction help us lord as you continue to work in us and through us to build us up to make us like christ help us to be your servants in all things, Lord, I ask your blessing on everybody that's listening to this, that they can be drawn near to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much for joining us this morning.